Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from five different countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. And here today by Alexis. Uh, hi, that's me. Alessio. Ciao a tutti. Audrey. Hey, everyone. David. Hey, hey. And today I'm your host, Fen. Hello. We're going to be talking about a range of different topics from across the hobby. And today we'll start with introductions. Uh, no problem. Um, my usual nickname is Xelas. Uh, I'm known around the Kingdom Net community as the Grumless Speaker. <laughs> I've, I've mostly been a role-playing addict for uh, years now and first got into the into the board game as seen with um, Kingdom Death. And then uh, later I turned into a holder of Kickstarter's cooperative storytelling games. My first, uh, my first love has always been uh, proper role-playing games. Okay, great. And uh, next of all, Alessio. Oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> Actually, hi, hi everyone. I am Alessio. My nickname usually is Techlist. You usually find me on mostly on KDM forums. I actually lurk or uh, participate in discussions among board games. I am always been a board game and an RPG enthusiast, but I think I began uh, in 1989. I was just eight in the t- at the time with Hero Quest. I think he was mostly a board gamer with Games Workshops product. I was there in the golden age of Blood Bowl and uh, on Manowar and Necromunda mostly. And I played since second edition of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Uh, since then, uh, as a modern board gamer, I'm a big niche head. <laughs> this, is not, uh, this is not a shared uh, passion around uh, across the board gamer community, but that's it. I, I won a Geek Citizenship badge. Uh, and I happened to win a BGG contest, so they are real. And basically, the, and I happened to win a BGG contest, so they are real. And basically, that's all there's to know about me, except that I am a board gamer dad. I, have a, I am a father of two, and I am a programmer as my day job. And that's really all. Okay, great. So next up, day, day job. And that's really all. Okay, great. So next up would be Audrey. You tell us all about you. Yeah. Hi again, everyone. I'm French. You can hear it, I imagine. And I've been a role-playing gamer for 15 years now. And I started jumping into 15 years now. And I started jumping into board games and especially miniature board games four years ago, four and a half exactly now. Uh, what I enjoy most are co-op games and painting the miniatures that come for the games. That's really one of the things that I enjoy the most. When a game has pretty minis that I would like to paint, and when a game has pretty minis that I would like to paint and put in my display cabinet. So in the miniature painting communities, you will find me under the nickname of Millennia with two L's. And I think that's the main for me. Okay, all right. So David, do spill. Yeah, hey, hey. So basically, um, yeah, hey, hey. So basically, um, I started with uh, the role playing and board games like when I was 14 years old. I started with uh, Warhammer Fantasy and uh, played a lot of different board games, tabletop games, and role playing games. Um, most of the time, I stick with uh, role playing, tabletop games, and role playing games. Um, most of the time, I stick with uh, role playing games. I met my wife through the <laughs> role playing game hobby, which is not that often, I think. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I got into Kingdom Death like two years ago. Miniatures Online, I was thinking like, what the hell is that game? And yeah, since then I ended up in the board game community. I'm admin and uh, moderator of several subreddits and discords. I'm more like the community guy in the background. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, and that just leaves me. My name's Fencast, or through uh, my Patreon, which is very heavily Kingdom Death based. Uh, I first got into miniatures through a copy of Hero Quest owned by my grandfather. And from there, I picked up a copy of Warhammer Quest back in 2008, where before it became. Um, it's, I think it's time to get into our topic. So, the way the format of this podcast is going to be 
is uh, each of us is going to bring a topic to the table. We're going to talk a bit about it and discuss and then move on to the next topic. So it's going to be kind of punchy about a few different things. With today, we are starting with, with today, we are starting with Alexis, uh, who's going to be talking about Town Folk Tussle. Since most of us are very familiar with Kingdom Death, Town Folk Tussle is, is a pretty good topic to start our podcast, I think. So it is uh, upcoming on Kickstarter, uh, starting on October the 20th by a panic roll. On Kickstarter, uh, starting on October the 20th by a panic roll. Most of us gave it a try so far, and I think that uh, the entire podcast really enjoyed what we've seen. It's a boss battler with a 30s cartoon style. Think Popeye or more recently the video game Cuphead, a very uh, cartoony old style, very uh, cartoony old style. Uh, sort of artwork that I think looks absolutely beautiful. And it uses the same sort of gameplay that Kingdom Death pioneered, but in my opinion, it is distilled and refined into um, something that is much more readily unclear. So in the game, each player incarnates a different colorful character with two abilities and four stats. And the game is split into a taunt phase where they buy randomized equipment and a fight face against a bigger boss with an AI deck that is then used to, to control the monster. Whether it gives each player a sort of mini quest during the combat phase to accomplish during the fight to get a little reward. While the game is cooperative, some of them can be slightly antagonizing between the player, but in a, in a friendly way without breaking the, the game, but it's more interesting, I feel. Uh, for example, one player might want to never be targeted in a fight or be targeted a certain number of time, or it's, they, uh, they might have to cause environmental damage to their allies or to the boss. It really helps making each fight against one of those boss, making each fight against one of those boss extremely different from the other. Uh, and if you combine that with the different playable character, the fact that each boss has a uh, full difficulty level, it makes the game surprisingly replayable, even in the current demo state on a tabletop simulator, even in the current demo state on a tabletop simulator with only four bosses. Every time I played, the, the slight differences in, co in combination made each fight feel very unique and fun. Fan is the one that uh, brought the game up. I gotta say that, that you had a very good eye in bringing this. Uh, I gotta say that, that you had a very good eye in bringing this. Uh, don't for us all feel like someone looked at Kingdom Death, got it anything superfluous, and left out a refined version of it. It's a game that you really might want to play regularly with friends, but it's also a game that I could see myself picking up, explaining to people. It's also a game that I could see myself picking up, explaining to people, and within 20 minutes, uh, get to play with people that have never played any kind of a complicated board game. I think that's a pretty good introduction to uh, allow people to, to chime in on it. I I think you've nailed it really with what what makes this so good on top of I think you've nailed it really with what what makes this so good on top of the aesthetic which for those of you who aren't familiar with Cuphead and uh, the less well known Bendy and the Ink Machine it's a kind of retro Disney esque nineteen twenties ish animation animation aesthetic but it has a very dark very dark kind of undertone the characters are a bit sort of odd and twisted, but not in ways that you would be particularly concerned about, kind of like a Hanna-Barbera, Wile E. Coyote, Warner Bros. kind of way, sort of a, a bit more violent and, and dark than the more modern children's cartoons are, but still. And the other part I think that is so good is, yeah, they, as you said, they've cut everything superfluous off this. It reminds me in some ways of Fireteam Zero. Fireteam Zero, which I will talk about at some point in this podcast, is a um, cooperative miniatures horde style dilled um, simple experience. The AI in Fireteam Zero is really dumb, like really, really dumb, but it doesn't matter in that experience. It is perfect for the way the game works. Here, the monsters, sorry, the ruffians, to give them their proper name, are um, not as, as uh, reactive and different uh, and the order you encounter them in even it 
interacts a bit and changes the way they behave. So all of that on top of the cartoon aesthetic, on top of everything else, and the fact that it's been offered uh, in what seems to be a fairly compact fashion, from what I understand, they're talking about putting out the game and maybe some stretch goals. But yeah, one thing I, one thing I like to add is uh, that the developers of Panic Raw uh, are really engaged with the community. That's one thing I really appreciate, especially after our like collective experience of Kingdom Death. <laughs> it's really really good that they uh, are actually they uh, are actually on the Discord. The community discord and yeah just engage with their community and talk with them and they are collecting a lot of feedback so i have a really good feeling that the game will be really po polished and well done when it's when it's ready to hit, hit the kickstarter a pretty good change well done when it's when it's ready to hit, hit the kickstarter a pretty good change from some other games yeah one thing I really enjoy with the aesthetics is it makes me think of Wallace and Gromit or Sean the Sheep, the spin-off. And I think that even for beginner miniature painters, this will be easy to paint. And I think that even for beginner miniature painters, this will be easy to paint. You can just put color on them and they will be great. You don't have to overwork them or just to even work them to make them stand out on the table. Yeah, they reminded me of the um, uh, the uh, stuffed fables model. The um, uh, the uh, stuffed fables models, which are a soft PVC, but unlike many soft PVC models, because they're very rounded and quite um, cartoony in style, they were absolutely a delight to paint. It is a very short campaign that uh, will amount for four, fight, four fights and an alternation of fight and town face and fight and town face. I think if you are experienced enough, you can do that in an afternoon playing with experienced people. And that is actually great. Uh, the visuals are cuphead like. Yes, it's the most direct. I, I heard them classified as evil Betty Boop cartoons. So since it's fun, I wanted to mention that. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I really enjoyed about the game too was the fact that each item that the uh, the players can equip comes with a really different um, armor. They usually have flavor in their art and their actual abilities. And I think that thanks to the, the randomized shop, even if some items are very specific in their, uh, in their use, you can always have a, a good selection and it also really enhances the replayability. Like each time that you play, you're going to have different loadouts. I, I think that they really did a good job into, um, into making the game feel both unique and fun, but also very easy to get into. Like any board game player would just be able to jump into it, even only reading half of the rule set. Like the, the, it's even only reading half of the rule set. Like the, 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 the world game is, I think, very well designed. Yeah, and dice lovers, don't fear. There is still room for dice to ruin everything. Yeah, yeah I'll lose it. <laughs> I, I guess well, you mentioned the gear, it made me think as well. I really appreciate the... Um, I guess well, you mentioned the gear, it made me think as well. I really appreciate the, um, the use of tropes they've put into the characters. So, Because a game like this, some games very... They give you a tabula rasa as a character, just kind of, you know, your standard blank slate and go, here you go. To see what direction they develop in here you kind of lands within a class um with a little bit of a twist which i like so like yancey uh the blacksmith is a kind of a traditional tank type he's tougher than the others his gear initial gear helps him with that he has abilities that allow him to taunt the uh the ruffian and keep him focused um then you've got lots rather than really dealing damage themselves they can do it and then you've got um Quintus Binch, best boy, my favorite character. He's a boy scout, evil boy scout, but he's like a he's like a traditional rogue, like a like a thug type. Like every boy scout. Yep. And then there's my other favorite character, old Gram Gram, Scranny Melba. Way they twisted things. She's she's um long sighted, far sighted. So she's terrible 
at accuracy up close because she can't see. So she's encouraged to always keep her distance and she gets in a lot of trouble when the ruffian gets close to her, which again goes back to Yancey, who has the ability to sort of pull the ruffian away if it's getting too close so she can maneuver better. Um, of the other characters, um, Bul Henlo Bulwark, who is a uh, support healer type. Um, there's, who's the other one? Who am I forgetting? Oh, there's Fishman. Yes, N Norman Fishman. Kind of a long, medium, longish range, attacking longish range, attacking type, a little bit more durable, um, but more more melee based. And oh, there's uh, I've there's Iron Gut as well, who we haven't actually seen the stats for yet. He, um, Iron Gut is a I think the corpse of a cow king, from what I've gathered. Cow king. From what I've gathered, but I'm speculating here just based on a, a, a screenshot I found. That sounds like a very interesting uh, new character. But yeah, they they all have a very unique personality, even if they fall into a sort of comfortable uh, archetype, a sort of comfortable uh, archetype. Yeah, they yeah. do. It gives you a nice little uh, handle to just sort of get in there. And, um, and and understand what might be good and useful for you to get as gear, which I like. And also gives a lot of potential for them to, uh, so gives a lot of potential for them to uh, to have expansions going on. You, you could easily like see them releasing a year from now. Here's a new ruffian. Here's some new event cards. Here's a uh, townsfolk who is linked to that ruffian and has some special interactions. Yeah, and since the, the whole game is, yeah, and since the, the whole game is relatively simple to expand on, I wouldn't even be surprised to see uh, a new map, maybe, or a new type of uh, of environment with different um, with different turn cards, or just some few changes that can make the uh, the base experience uh, completely different. Like I think that they created a base mold that will be very easy to expand on, and that is already very much replayable. Um, one thing that I really liked is the fact that there's very little need to uh, keep notes. Uh, like your each ruffians, uh, each uh, players has their own uh, to keep note in between fight and all of that. It's all based on your inventory. So uh, once again, packing the game back uh, into the box and uh, pulling it uh, out of it and then into the table is extremely easy. Uh, I wouldn't even be surprised if making a, a sort of um, vignette uh, since you basically would only need to draw a few equipment and then just jump into it yeah yeah i just took a quick look to check my notes um it's george iron gut uh he appears to be a yeah deceased like cow king by the look of it a living stomach uh i can't get the full details but his abilities are these are called leftovers and quick trot and stat wise he seems to have three health and then falls on everything uh, four four and minus one so he's looking a bit kind of middle-ish but who knows what his gear is going to be like and what his abilities are actually going to do but it's a very uh a bit of a grim looking piece of a piece of art possibly the a grim looking piece of a piece of art possibly the nastiest looking of all of the characters which i like it's a it's, as i say it's nasty in a fun way not in a <laughs> that's not suitable for kids way Right. Uh, so before we move on to our next topic, does anyone have anything further they'd like to say beyond the generally gushing? Uh, you'd like to say beyond the generally gushing. Uh, this is a really great thing, a fantastic game. It's landing twentieth of October on Kickstarter, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, at least, I would say if you're only going to back one game for the rest of the year, this should be it. And if you're not going to back any games, you might want to have a good one to get like the basic game um, on the Kickstarter because one, I love Kickstarter being used by new companies to to support you know the, as Kickstarter was originally intended, uh, and two, this is I think the biggest uh, step forward in the behind supporting this. I'm like, get it, do it. This is this is great. You're not going to regret it. Um, yeah, the one thing that I would add is that the game is currently as currently a demo on the um, tabletop simulator. Uh, just jump in; like it, it costs nothing. Give it a try, and even if you um, if you're not planning to games and have a lot of fun with some of your friends, so yeah, I would recommend you at least try the, the tabletop simulator version. 
as it's cost nothing as long as you already own tabletop simulator on steam that's just that's true most people do but if you don't all right well we shall move on to our second topic which is alessio's which is alessio's and we're going to be talking about a kingdom death related topic we should we'll probably have one of these each episode at least maybe two uh, as all of us if you probably gathered from the introductions have a fair amount of involvement with um the game in some fashion or another uh so i believe you want to talk to uh so i believe you want to talk to us uh, about the uh, it's the butcher that's taking your fancy this this episode isn't it uh, yeah actually oh my turn already okay so let's talk about the butcher it's, uh, I chose uh, a subject I know a lot for this. Uh, I chose uh, a subject I know a lot for this first intervention, hoping that uh, I don't uh, screw it that bad. So I apologize in advance for my horrible, horrible Italian accent, and I hope to bring you into the world of Kingdom Death. Now, I want to talk about, about how the design of a monster conveys a lot of useful information just in the showdown part. Uh, the Butcher is uh, one of the three possible first nemesis you will ever face. Uh, I'll, I assume you know that the other is the Tyrant. In, and the third one, uh, well, I leave that as a trivia for you to guess what it is. Uh, now, the Butcher is the first nemesis you will encounter, and it just appears in your settlement. All you know is this small, small piece of text, which tells you that it was also so afraid, so scared, that uh, he didn't want to be anymore, and he wore a mask to uh, turn its fear into rage. And this is the basic idea of the Butcher. Of course, the concept of the monster, the visual of the monsters, remember you of uh, Slash of the monster, the visual of the monsters, remember you of uh, Slasher movie villains. So, uh, and actually, it, its drop is jig, is kind of the Slasher movie villain in which you still find uh, it reappearing over and over again, even if, if you kill it, still find uh, it reappearing over and over again, even if, if you kill it. And of course, there is a debate if there is one butcher or multiple butchers. I am not to discuss this, and anyway, there are multiple butchers. <laughs> so the important part here is that the, there are multiple butchers. <laughs> so the important part here is that the core of the monster, uh, or at least my theory is that the monster is an Thing afraid and it's afraid of everything and you can see it into the design and into how the showdown goes in my hands right now out of the 21 or so useful AI cards and four of them are moods so actually there are 17 AI cards you usually use 14 of them target as first the closest threat facing so actually the butcher lashes out with rage a scared monster who is afraid of everything and uh, just lashes out with rage because that's what a forsaken mask does. Uh, it turns your fear into rage. And that's it. The core of the monster you can see with, uh, with the other three, which is, well, the butcher attacks people to the world to get their lanterns or to get their lights. And this is because it is afraid of the dark. You can see in the heart for the cards and for the showdown that the butcher just curves the face of its big lanterns. So to make him company, I, we don't know, possibly we will see with the Henshin Butcher campaign, we will see in the people of the Mirror Stone in the campaigns of death. What we can assume is that the butcher attacks because it's basically afraid of the dark, so it gets to the land. Big light in, in the distance. It uh, isn't uh, scared of the presence uh, in there. <laughs> so uh, it's not scared because it's crazy. And uh, it basically attacks all threats that come near. So a butcher at core 
of course, if you go to analyze the rest of the cards, you can see that, uh, well, if you go to the HL deck, basically every location is called Furious. It has a lot of reflex actions. So that's basically the, that conveys the Berserker. So that's basically the, that conveys the Berserker theme you have uh, a thing that attacks a lot. You had the 1.3 uh, Forsaker mask that uh, did a very good job of telling you what the butcher did, because basically that uh, did a very good job of telling you what the butcher did, because basically when you wore a Forsaker mask, you had an additional activation to use in your turn. Now it uh, just focuses on the making you uh, crazy and uh, having you leave the settlement at the end. Uh, making you uh, crazy and uh, having you leave the settlement at the end of the shutdown. So uh, it's actually not that interesting anymore. It is two aspects of the same characterization, but you can see in the smooth things in the cars that make the butcher showdown. So you actually see the butcher is uh, lashing out always with a very poor accuracy at you. So every attack mm -hmm. is usually fast and it has a four plus accuracy. This basically identifies a monster which, uh, <laughs> which just uh, throws slashes with incredible velocity, with incredible speed and uh, doesn't hit a lot because actually ac accuracy is the most glaring weakness of the butcher. This is is scared, and that's basically my point. I I actually discussed that with uh, with the guys here. I don't know if they agree completely with that, but it's basically the butcher's geek. Yeah. I um I really like your analysis of the butcher's cards and sort of personality that is told to those AI and HL cards. Yeah, I've got a bit more to add into the the, the puzzle. I don't, I I do a bit more to add into the, the the puzzle. I don't, I I do agree with what you're saying. Um, I think there's also a lot more to it, and I think we're going to see some more in campaigns of death. But um, back on the store when I think it was the resume was released, they added some more information. Um, the butcher's not just like a standalone kind of th butcher's not just like a standalone kind of thing it's a um it's to quote the text the butcher is the remains of forsaker swallowed by long years of wrestling with the primal rage that gave him power nothing remains of the man just a mess of flesh clinging to the insides of the forsaker's armor animated by a nihilistic insides of the forsaker's armor animated by a nihilistic fury to destroy on the road to oblivion the butcher collects the lanterns and skinned faces of his victims, a perversion of the humanity that echoes inside its near hollow armor. Now, um, Forsakers are, they're survivors. So they're the like protagonist them actually through the courage track. So at the top end of the courage track, you have the see the truth event. And when you look at that in the um, rule book, you'll see the greatest courage is achieved when past and future are abandoned. The void that remains is a dark, endless well of strength, fear and pain, are your nourishment and you will feast. And uh, amongst the very, for a moment, opened your second eyelids. What you saw filled your mouth with a taste of your own death. And there's a whole sort of things that give you abilities and stuff. And uh, there's a lot of heavy references to the Butcher or to Forsakers right in there, which um, is, is kind of interesting in itself. Uh, Forsakers themselves are those who lose or give up for in a pitiful struggle around them, incapable of compassion. They channel their despair into unchecked, furious, berserk state that makes the Forsaker dangerous, dangerous to friend or foe alike. The Forsaker has lost so much that his perspective has been skewed beyond repair. Um, yeah, it does repeat accordingly. They abandoned their own humanity to better suit the struggle. Accordingly, they abandoned their own humanity to better suit the struggle that they see around them. And uh, the fu their fury is so consuming and violent, they often fix their weapons with a rope or chain to their hands in anticipation of succumbing to their succumbing to their mindless rage dreams. So yeah, they are the butchers. Like seem to be a further evolution along the forsaker. A further evolution along the forsaker chain. The forsaker, if I understand correctly was originally going to be one of the playable classes for kingdom death labyrinth but i'm not 100 percent certain on that because it's a bit lost in the annals of time 
this is interesting because uh, there's uh, another card linked to, uh, there's uh, another card linked to the butcher in a way which is the butch- the butcher's mandy actually i don't know what is the pronounce of this so <laughs> i just call it mandy it is basically another way to nail the point which is uh, as uh, as you increase your insanity you get fast it you get you get rage and rage as uh, as long as you descend into a pit of insanity uh, and of course this links the ba- the butcher in a way to the silver city and there has been a lot of fun theories about that and we it's probably a meet for another article but uh, it is the point is cu- continuously delivered and nailed and nailed again I I like what you pointed out that the, the Forsaker are sort of further along the crush track that where the survivors can get to, because the butcher itself is sort of a perversion of courage. Then uh, is cowardly. I think that there's a nice symmetry here to to see and to examine. Personally, what I really like about the butcher as a as a nemesis, uh, more more on the the gameplay side is the fact that, in my opinion, it's the best nemesis of the people of the Lantern because it really perfectly nails of the people of the Lantern because it really perfectly nails what a nemesis should be, in my opinion. When you read... Yeah. When you... As a fight, it's great. As a, as a sort of a challenge and a difficulty check. But I think that also just the feel of... Um, Pulling, but I think that also just the feel of um, pulling it out of the box, reading the cards and being like, okay, we have to fight this thing. We've only fought like uh, White Lion so far. You read the Berserker card that is like, it grows two AI cards a turn. That's a massive shock. It seems impossible. Two AI cards a turn. That's a massive shock. It seems impossible to do. And what I really like about the Butcher is that it hides the fact that it's not that hard. For example, it uh, reshuffles its hit location at every turn. And when you first read that, you think that's just added difficulty, but instead it's helping you along. That you think that's just added difficulty, but instead it's helping you along. It's very good that it reshuffles its uh, hit location deck. It also has a very low accuracy and you don't really notice how just two points of accuracy make a massive difference in a game when you first start. And so a mountain that seems impossible to defeat start. And so a mountain that seems impossible to defeat at the first at the start of the game is actually not that hard. And I think that Adam really nailed uh, the feel of that fight. And what I really like also is that at the end of the game, when you fight, fight the level three, it is that same shock uh, all over again, uh, all over again with Invincible and with the uh, the second AI card. And now I don't know if we want to tell the solution to the trivia, but the third nemesis you could face uh, as a, as your first nemesis is of course the Slenderman. If you happen to draw the, actually we'll be talking about that at some point because there's a lot of interesting things. Um, pretty aware of time or we try not to be too long in each of these subjects but there's a number of things i'd still want to talk about on the butcher because it's a very interesting monster yeah i oh, first of all i really appreciate like i i will say of the three nemesis monsters in the core game this turns up and it goes hey h- how are you doing can you beat this and a lot of people don't manage it on their first try and having it come early enough at least it's not too discouraging um it's also the most rewarding fight but what I love most of all about this is when you get past the initial sort of aesthetic, there also, uh, there's a uh, scenario, uh, and I can answer this like on the debate of whether there's one butcher or lots of butchers, there's almost certainly more than one butcher, but I think each individual butcher is way harder to kill than you actually think. They generally teleport away to get away when they're in a very bad state. The uh, death blow, they're in a very bad state. The uh, death blow resolves that with a and with a different matter, um, as does the maximum roll on the rewards chart, where you actually, I believe, get to explode the butcher into pieces. But uh, they they do have some kind of mystical abilities. The lantern frenzy card has them teleported. The lantern frenzy card has them teleported into it. Uh, all of which builds into. And you mentioned it briefly, the fact that these the butcher is basically your archetypal 1980s slasher villain. Specifically, 
Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th series, but also from the Friday the 13th series, but also uh, who, who Jason Voorhees is very well known for teleporting all over the place and being in ridiculous places where he shouldn't be and suddenly he's there. But also Michael Myers from uh, Halloween, uh, who is all, both of these are mortal men who through events have become immortal, in, who through events have become immortal, indestructible, terrifying, ridiculous pieces of nonsense. I remember watching Halloween H2O and seeing Michael Myers be attacked with a chainsaw and having it spark off his arms and thinking, what on earth is going on here? How is this interesting? Um, but yeah, and, and I think it's worth noting that, um, but yeah, and, and I think it's worth noting that in both of these cases, if you take a look, um, the linking thing that for Jason Voorhees, who only turns up, I think, in the second movie onwards, um, and Michael Myers, is they both wear white masks. In Jason's case, it's a white hockey mask. In um, in Jason's case, it's a white hockey mask. In um, Michael Myers' case, it is well, William painted um, white, most famously. But the Butcher, the Forsaker mask, is also a white mask, and uh, as you learn, it's made from a face. You can actually construct one yourself if you meet the level three butcher, and construct one yourself if you meet the level three butcher. Under certain circumstances, one of your survivors will peel their own face off and fashion it into a forsaken mask, which is like, you know, very interesting and cool. And a lot of what I liked about the AI, and I thought an alternate take on looking on it is the butcher. If you're not a threat, it won't attack you on it is the butcher. If you're not a threat, it won't attack you at all. It'll stand over you and menace you, which is very much like the slasher movie villain who attacks anything that's sort of up and running and could possibly do stuff. But then, you know, when people fall on the floor and start panicking a bit, especially if they're the final girl, it'll menace over them and over them and give them a chance to get away. And I thought that's like really good. And I do give Adam some like flack at times, but when it comes to the butcher, I, they, I don't think uh, outside of I don't like the change to the Forsaken mask, but outside of that, I think everything here is just this is that's the best three in my opinion. There's just one small thing I would like to add: uh, Barry the Chopper, <laughs> which <laughs> is like a pretty good. Yeah, I feel it's like was an inspiration for it as well, like with the mask and the weapon of choice for the for the butcher. Oh, from Full Metal Alchemist, yeah. yes. Metal yeah. Alchemist, yes. It could well be a reference also, certainly. I never heard of Barry the Chopper because I am um, decidedly not uh, not particularly into anime. Um, visually, he looks like he looks like the Butcher, a lot like the Butcher. I haven't seen this before, and yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I also have to say we are by Diablo series, so actually Butcher is a pretty common name. And it could have been an inspiration, either direct or indirect, both to the F Full Metal Alchemist anime and uh, to, well, all the rest of the Butchers. I think it's best to move on, give it more, because we now have Audrey with a section on hobby stuff. And I'm very much looking forward to this. I believe Audrey's going to be talking about the um, uh, beginner's kit and what you should do when you're starting out painting, because it's a question that uh, we get quite often. Take it away. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I've put to see like no airbrush, for instance, even though it's an item that we fast hear about, but I've really laid out the basics. So the first basic tool that new painters need, of course, is paint. No joke, Sherlock. <laughs> Miniature painting brands have beginner paint sets. You will find between 8 to 20 paints in these sets, and they will lay out the foundation that you will use for all of your painting. So major brands that have these sets would be Vallejo, with their, that have these sets would be Vallejo with their model color basic US asset, which is one of the most complete sets. The Scale 75 Smog Rider set, which comes with a miniature, which is a good point if you don't really want to work on your own miniatures first, but want to have one to try out things. Miniatures first, but want to have one to try out things first. The Army Painter starter set, which comes with one brush, which gives another advantage, another value in extra in this set. 
Of course, you will also get a set from Games Workshop and Reaper in the USA is from Games Workshop and Reaper in the USA is very easy to find in the UK as well. In Europe, it's a bit less available. Since these sets are a bit um, limited in the amount of paint, don't hesitate to pick one, two, and don't hesitate to pick one, two, and up to five colors on top of that and to really complete what you have and what you will start from. If you are painting miniatures from board games that have lots of texture, getting a set of washes, mostly a black washes, mostly a black brown will be a very good addition and it will help you get some depth in your miniatures. So you will end up with 20 to 30 bottles of paints, and that's really the essential that you will need. You don't you, the essential that you will need. You don't you can mix. You can always mix more colors from these ones, and that is enough. You don't really need to have a full collection of paints when you start. The second thing that you will need. Will the second thing that you will need will be primers because on miniatures it's easier to get the paint to stick if you prime your miniature first. It's possible to paint without primer but it takes a bit experience and getting used to it. Generally, generally priming works in two ways. The first one is color primer. Like if your miniature will be in majority green, you prime it green and it will save you some time painting green. The second thing is if you have miniatures with primers in the black and white um, side of the chroma. For these ones, there are different techniques, different habits and it's up to you to decide if you will want to paint on black, on gray, on white. It's really, or you can do something that is called zenithal priming, which is black with white sprayed on top of it. This will help you see the volumes of the miniature and see where you can paint lighter colors, where you can paint darker colors. Good example, press. And it seems to be good when some when some other whites can end up a bit chalky and make some texture on the miniature. Depending on where you live and the weather, primer in cans, in spray cans like these ones, can be sometimes too to warm, uh, sorry, that's the same, <laughs> too dry, I meant. And so, if you live in one such place, you may want to use brush on primer. So this is primer that you will just brush on the miniature. You don't need to reach full coverage uh, because the primer is just coverage uh, because the primer is just here to help the paint catch. So you don't need your miniature to be fully of the color of the brush and primer. And three examples will be the Vallejo polyurethane primer. So again, you can pick black gray or white, depending on what you will like, um, depending on what you will like. Um, the Stein Arrays, which is available in the US, and the Stein Arrays is also available in Europe and, the, and some other parts of the world as the MIG One Shot Primer by Amo MIG. So you have your choice of primers. So you have your choice of primers. Now, what else will you need? Of course, brushes. You don't need five different size of brushes. Usually a size two and a size zero are enough. You can use the size two as your workhorse to do all your, you can use the size two as your workhorse to do all your base coating work, to do some detail if the tip is really sharp. And you can have a zero to do some detail. You don't need to go to sizes lower than zero because with these smaller brushes, you have a risk that the paint will dry on it before you have a risk that the paint will dry on it before you can apply it on the miniature. Ideally, these brushes should be Collingsky type. So these are uh, weasel hair. 
and some common brands will be uh, watercolor brands that you can get in art stores, color brands that you can get in art stores. So you will have the Winsor & Newton Series 7, Da Vinci Maestro Series 10, the Raphael 8404 or 8408. They have different dimensions that you might or might not prefer. You can also get more synthetic brushes as you can also get more synthetic brushes as workers if you want to save your best brushes. You can also get synthetic brushes of, to apply the primer because it's um, more chemically um, dangerous for the bristles of your brushes. So you can say, oh, I'm going to brush for the bristles of your brushes. So you can say, oh, I'm going to pick a two, two whichever currency you're using, a uh, synthetic brush for my primer, it's perfect. Also, a very good thing is that one of the first techniques that you may use is dry brushing. And one tip is that you may use is dry brushing. And one tip is that makeup brushes, and especially eyeshadow brushes, make very good dry brushes because they have just the right stiffness of brushes for this. It's really a great tool to have for this application. If you're getting application, if you're getting Kolinsky or other natural hair brushes, if you can pick a soap, a brush soap, that will be helpful to get them last longer. So you have one very common brush soap, which is the master's brush soap, and it's really cheap and it will last you really cheap and it will last you four years. I paid mine, I think seven euros three years ago and I still have a good a time with it. Next item will be the palette. You have two types of palettes in the miniature painting. You have the dry thin the paint on it. That's going to be some sheet of aluminium, a tile, whatever you want, a plate maybe. You're really free to get whatever you want. If you decide to pick a wet palette, there are lots of different ones, both from the art commercial art companies and to give two of the biggest ones. They all come with everything you need, the sponge, the paper, the box. It's up to you to like the paper or not. Some people will like papers that are more um, translucent to water, that leave a bit more water through, some that leave less in your painting room and that your paint will dry very fast. It will help keep it wet for a few hours. Then I'm going, one other item that you will need is for when you've done painting. You're going to need varnish, especially if the miniatures that you are painting, will, you will touch them with your fingers. We have some grease on our fingers. We have some other components which are a bit acidic and it can damage the paint. So again, just as the spray cans for primer, varnish spray cans are often sensitive to weather. If you're spraying are often sensitive to weather, if you're spraying varnish in an environment that's a bit too dry, it can leave a white mist on the miniature. So it's something to be wary of. Again, every miniature brand has varnishes. So it will be up to you again to find which one you like. And I don't have a special one which one you like. And I don't have a special one to recommend because I varnish with my airbrush. And so I don't know for sp varnish spray cans. Um, I what? could chime in there, actually. Yeah. Okay, so I've tried a number of different different ones. Um, Games were different, different ones. Um, Games Workshop, unfortunately, I don't think do a pure matte one anymore, but their satin is very yeah. good um, and quite resistant. My all-time top two are uh, the Vallejo matte varnish, um, fantastic varnish. Um, fantastic, and Tester's Dull Coat, which uh, now I'm in Sweden, I have trouble getting. So I use uh, Vallejo's, and I actually use those while painting as well, to because um, well, I paint with a, a bunch of um, they're more resin, more translucent paints, and they can get quite shiny while I'm painting translucent paints, and they can get quite shiny while I'm painting. So I tend to like apply a coat of this varnish part way through, and it's great that it's in a spray can. Um, 
so it doesn't I, I don't have to like clean up my airbrush and break my flow i just spray it and then dry it quick with a hair dryer and it goes super matte so those are my two recommendations and it goes super matte so those are my two recommendations um Vallejo's or testers dull coat i would be very careful with the army painter sprays um i have found they are incredibly sensitive to humidity incredibly so um i have and it's nothing is more frustrating than finishing a model and it's nothing is more frustrating than finishing a model and spraying it and suddenly it's frosted white and it's possible to save that but sometimes you just have to strip the whole model and start again so you know big one there i uh, be careful with army painter varnishes and the real trick is if you're not sure about and the real trick is if you're not sure about the weather or anything have yourself like a test model or a, a test sheet or something you can spray on and you can look to see if it's frosting. Even like just a crimp, crumpled up bit of paper with some paint on it, just to check if it, everything's okay and right. If you're not sure, check if it, everything's okay and right. If you're not sure, um, do what Audrey does and use airbrushing for varnishes and even for your base coats. Because you know, airbrushing is what I use during the winter here in Sweden because it's too cold for um, spray cans, except in our garage. Anyway, except in our garage. Anyway, there we go. Yeah, Carry thank on. you. Thank you for the compliment. So as Sven said, he mentioned matte varnish. I think Testors is being discontinued, by the way. I need to check again. Uh, matte varnish has the advantage of not adding reflections on top of adding reflections on top of the paint job that you did so it's really going to show what you painted it's going to slightly distort the colors but really much less than gloss varnish or satin varnish you can though apply gloss or satin varnish up to what you like to bring them sh shine back that matte varnish can kill yeah, and then there are two other categories of tools that you need if your minis are not pre-assembled. In board games, many miniatures come already pre-assembled, so you really don't have men still do with these pre-assembled miniatures. So you will find sometimes gaps. For example, if an arm was glued on a torso, you might find some gaps around the shoulder. So you can use you can use lots of different putties to fill the gaps. Two of the most common are milliput and green stuff. They are workable in a different tool if you're using milliput, but Vaseline is much more convenient for green stuff. So it's going to work a bit in a different way. And these two pastes are great for big gaps. So in board games, you don't often encounter big gaps unless the miniatures come and as miniatures will often have smaller gaps and for this what i love is the vallejo plastic putty it's really it's a bit it's a paste almost like toothpaste and you can really apply it and push it into the small crannies in the miniatures and it dries quite fast so you can see the need to add just a bit more to apply these paints, you can find shapers in steel or some kind of silicone brushes with a, with a fine tip that will help you push the putties and smooth them out on your miniature. And finally, the latest category of nippers, which will help you cut the different parts of the plastic sprue, which is a kind of frame that will um, help keep the pieces together while they ship. You can pick any nippers uh, from any miniature brand, of, even from model kits. If you find a shop nearby, model kits. If you find a shop nearby that sells train or planes model kits, this nipper will be completely great for miniature painting. And the last tool is glue, of course. You will find three major categories of glues that we can use, and these depend on categories of glues that we can use and these depend on the material and or the size of what you're gluing. If you're painting and if you're owning miniatures that are made of HIPS, that's for the polystyrene that comes in sprue, for example the miniatures of in sprue, for example the miniatures of Kingdom Death, but also of the Marvel Crisis Protocol um, skirmish game, 
or Games Workshop miniatures, plastic glue will be a great choice. The plastic glue, it in fact, in fact, is not a glue, but a solvent, and it will help dissolve just a bit the solvent, and it will help dissolve just a bit the plastic, and you will chemically weld the pieces together. So you will have something that will hold very well. So if you made a mistake while gluing your miniatures, it will be hard to separate the pieces together. But if your mini falls, it might not. But if your mini falls, it might not break. The second type of glue is the cyanoacrylate, also called super glue. Uh, this one will glue everything. It works for plastic miniatures, it works for metal, it works for resin miniatures, so you can use it for everything. But if you miniatures, so you can use it for everything. But if you drop your miniature on the floor, for instance, the glue is very brittle and so can break. But if you messed up gluing your miniatures, you can put it in the fridge for a few hours and then the glue will break. If you are, will break. If you are gluing some big pieces together, you can use double components epoxy instead of uh, super glue or instead of plastic glue if applicable. And this will really make a stronger bond, but I will only recommend it for big pieces as it's a bit less, I will only recommend it for big pieces as it's a bit less convenient to use. So that's it for the toolkit. Uh, if you have any question, we will uh, be sure to check comments and help you. If anyone has any question here, if anyone has any question here or has anything else to add, um, I, I, I'm less uh, less good of a painter as a you or or fan. Um, so I, I might have a few questions. Uh, but it would probably necessitate for uh, it would probably be another topic recommend for someone who wants to first paint uh, something that is easy but that also allow them to have a, diff a few different um, type of, of highlights or, or techniques to try and, uh, and train on? I would say it depends uh, a bit on one or two things. Uh, to try out things, I would go to Reapers because they really have a wide range of items. Uh, lots of things are suited for D&D, for fantasy worlds, and you will really find anything. You want an old bear, you will get it. You want an adventurer with a sword, you will get it. And you won't be stuck with 10 times, for instance. So I think, yeah, if you really want one, two, three, four, five minis, which are all different from each other, that would be a good choice. Or there are some board games that will fit, like Fan mentioned uh, earlier, the stuffed fables, which will help you learn to manipulate your paints. On yeah, yeah. Um, I'd also say uh, it's worth um, considering because it's very convenient, easy to get your hands on. Would be some of the Snap Fit Games Workshop models, which are in a reasonable um, heroic scale um, and price. And uh, yeah, reasonable price. And also. Just go there, paint this, have it speak to you, get it, and don't be afraid. If you mess up, there are ways of stripping paint off and starting again. And the models are very robust, and you can do that quite a few times. So not a problem at all. Yeah, you can always strip and restart. Speaking of, I wanted your opinion. Mentioned all the time. And it's an investment to have a good airbrush setup. It's around 100 euro, 120 dollars, something like that. So if you are not sure you will like mini painting, don't jump on an airbrush right away. Agree with that. Absolutely. Um, to, to brush right away. Agree with that. Absolutely. Um, to, to add on to it, I do a little bit of airbrushing. I have immense problems with maintenance and upkeep of airbrushes. And that is not something that I find anyone covers very well, like within the miniature community, and partly because every airbrush is, is different uh, community, and partly because every airbrush is, is different. I mean, my current airbrush at the moment is out of commission because I dismantled it to clean it, put it back together, and now it's not um, propelling the air out past the needle. So I have to take the whole thing apart again and try and figure out what's going wrong. And... Um, each and every airbrush is sort of a little and um, 
each and every airbrush is sort of a little bit different. So uh, don't be put off by it because the um, the number of uses for airbrushes is incredible. You can use it for um, priming um, when the weather's bad. You can use it for controlled painting. You can use it in the way that um, Trent Denison does, which he basically uses the airbrush for Denison does, which he basically uses the airbrush for almost all of his jobs. He's a fantastic miniature painter you can catch him on instagram uh under big dino you can see his painting in progress on youtube under uh, trent dennison and um you know, he uses it for almost everything and and there's also a whole bunch of um of, of paint and, and there's also a whole bunch of um of, of painters who use their airbrushes as their finishing like you can get a smooth finish with lots of glazes but you can also do the same thing with clever work with an airbrush so it's an amazing tool but it will be frustrating I think you're thinking of Sergio Calvio as um, an example. Sergio's, de Sergio's definitely an example as well for finishing, yes. Yeah. I have two airbrushes. One is from uh, Harder and Steinbeck Colani, which is like a workhouse horse. You can pretty much put any paint in it and it will just work. And it's very easy to clean. And then I have Finity CR Plus, which is like immediately. They are like totally different tools, but they are doing a proper job most of the time, both of, both of them. But I prefer the Colani for priming and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, again, like any tool, it's trial and error and discovering which one you like more. But with an airbrush, it's a bit more an investment. So trying out. Makes sense, yeah. Yeah, I'd say um, the biggest piece of advice, though, is just don't be afraid. Everybody starts somewhere. You'll often see um, people on Instagram put up their first model. Um, and also uh, put up, you know, some of their, their latest pieces to show the difference. And, uh, you know, I, I will I will say their first model almost always, look, it is practice and refining and finding your own style, your own space. And you can follow guides and things, but uh, sometimes they're a bit bewildering when you're starting out. I think Serestos are very good for, for learning. And there's Painting Buddha, he still has stuff, although he stopped making new ones. They're on YouTube, but uh, just, just, just don't watch YouTube. But uh, just 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 don't worry about it. You, you just make your mistakes and you try again. You know they say ten thousand hours, and as uh, you know, you can quote Bob Ross. There's nothing but happy little accidents. You know. And enjoy yourself. You don't have to get better. If you like what you do, keep doing it. Better. If you like what you do, keep doing it. Absolutely. I am currently, and it sat right on the table in front of me, painting my Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles pledge, which arrived a couple of weeks ago, and I'll be talking about in the next episode. The models are PVC, and there's, uh, I don't know, over 100 of them, maybe 200 of them. Uh, I don't know, over 100 of them, maybe 200 of them. And I've just gone, all right, I don't, I don't have time to paint all of these up. I've got other things I need to do for, for other people and for myself. So I'm just putting base colors on all of them. And that's it, blocking them in, bit of back, black lining to increase the cartoony look, and they're going straight in the box, ready for play. A cartoony look, and they're going straight in the box, ready for play. And you know what? Still looks great on the table. Absolutely happy with them. All right. So uh, before we move on to the next topic, which is my topic, I'm just going to answer a, uh, a a thing that Alessio said back with the butcher. You weren't sure how to a thing that Alessio said back with the butcher. You weren't sure how to pronounce um, the the word. Yes, for the butcher, the um, Iron God item. It's a Mendy. Um, it's actually misspelt in Kingdom Death. Um, it should be M E H N D I, but it's spelled M H E N D D I, but it's spelled M H E N D I. You've seen them before. They are the intricate paintings you'll see on people's uh, hands. I think in Hindu in particular. So, but yes, it's a style, and yeah, Emendi, which is very simple and straightforward. Given the misspelling, you could be forgiven for pronouncing the Mahendi as well. Really, you could be forgiven for pronouncing the Mahendi as well really you know that's up to you it depends how you pronounce farting arts <laughs> yes yes those mighty secret farting arts yeah. <sighs> own your mistakes right uh okay so i wanted to talk about something i've been playing a fair bit recently so i wanted to talk about something i've been playing a fair bit recently um because it came out digitally on steam 
and that is the game of woodland might and right that is root which i think by now just about everyone in the board game community should be familiar with it in one way or another but to give a quicklier with it in one way or another but to give a quick synopsis it is a fantasy war game with asymmetric factions based in a cartoony children's woodlands um, forest uh, the ruling faction the eerie dynasty which is a bunch of faction the eerie dynasty which is a bunch of um populist uh bureaucrats more or less who promised the earth and then failed to deliver and get disposed were the original rulers they've recently been overthrown with the arrival of the marquis de cat or my kitty cat uh, the marquis uh, or my kitty cat uh, the marquis uh, brings with with them industrialization and a mighty force of well-armed cats and and the marquis is currently ruling the forest which is not really sitting well with the eerie dynasty or equally not sitting well with the actual inhabitants of the forest who are represented by, by the woodland alliance there are a bunch of bunnies rabbits foxes uh, wolves raccoons badgers beavers owls and so on they're just the main populace they make up the third faction and then the most clever faction of all within the game is the final one, which is the Vagabond, who isn't really, is actually just a, basically an RPG adventurer. Um, and it's like, suddenly they've taken a war game, they've made three asymmetric factions, and then they've taken a fourth faction and put in this 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 little uh, plucky little animal who just goes around doing quests and diving in ruins and kind of flicks back and forth. Is a great example of a game where aesthetic matters um to put it simply if root did not look the way it looks i would never have bothered playing it because it evoked to me like red wall and watership down and animals of farthing wood and all sorts uh, and the artwork is genuinely one of the most endearing things and not just the artwork the component quality as well incredibly cute pieces but uh, despite all of that cuteness laid on top it is vicious it is a incredibly well done um almost ecology um almost ecology because if you play the game each you, you gradually learn how each faction plays and for, the marquee is like one of the easiest to get into because the marquee plays much like a classic 4x faction of um expand exploit um expand exploit explore exterminate kind of thing um with i build buildings my buildings make troops my other buildings make gear um and i have a hospital it's and i make resources it's very straightforward but then you get to the eerie dynasty and they only have one building type they're roosts that do and they only have one building type they're roosts that do crafting and produce troops and produce points but you have to manage them basically by programming them um, which essentially you build a big long logic program and you have to follow it every turn if you cannot follow a single step the whole fact cannot follow a single step the whole faction collapses falls into turmoil your current leader is disposed deposed and disposed of probably and you have to pick a new one to bring in and that kind of changes how you have to play so throughout the whole of that game you're looking at it trying to figure out when can i afford to fall into trying to figure out when can i afford to fall into turmoil then in contrast the um the wooden alliance most famously were described by um uh shut up sit down as like a virus you know they're like they fight with guerrilla warfare and pamphlets and call in sympathy from the locals you go and come back uh, it's it's really enjoyable i was wondering how much um how if, if any of you guys here have had much of a chance to play root or at least look at it or anything like that i have looked at it a fair bit since i was um looking forward to to try the the actual rpg that they did uh absolutely delightful yeah it was around this time last year november last year because i backed it yeah um i have not yet had the chance to play it again since i don't have any uh anybody who uh who was interested to to play it at the moment but uh, I'm, I, I was very interested to it because I love uh, asymmetric that each faction that it's very different gameplay. And um, yeah, it, it looked really interesting. 
uh, but I have not yet had the chance to play it. Of my Hairi dynasty, actually moved by decree and uh, and the battle by decree is the most challenging part of the game. Sure, I saw the game and my brain was like, oh, and when I saw it was not co-op and I was, oh. <laughs> there is actually uh, some co-op, but you have to kind of get the clockwork expansion, which has just come out recently that allows for automated control of, of opponents. There is one just come out recently that allows for automated control of, of opponents. There is one in the main box. You can play a game with Marquis the Cat on running on automatic um, AI, and you can play cooperatively against that or cooperatively against a bunch of others. Uh, there is actually also, you can play team play uh, there is actually also you can play team play. Um, yeah, there, there are cards that cause people to to um, join up and have to play together uh, in a coalition. So it's not fully co-op, but it does have some options for that. You just declared a war on my wallet. I hope you know that. About that, um, I will say. Now we're getting onto wallet. The one major thing I think with root is. It's not just a one and done kind of thing. You're not, if you buy the main game, unless you're of a very particular personality type and playing group who like the solved game and late, eventually you, you might get tired with the factions. Um, because uh, this, you know, and I, I'm going to get a little critical just now because I find that. The factions, some of them are very limiting in what you need to do to start. And if you can't do that start, you're in a lot of trouble game. And then while they have a wide choice in where they go, eventually their games always devolve down to either trying to win through dominance, which is where you control three of the same um, uh, same clearing, same like fox clearings, or by crafting. If you try and win just through points, normally the Marquis de Cat can't manage it. So kind of frustrating. Uh, at least for me, because I like variety. Uh, the nice thing about that is once you get tired with the Marquis, you can go on and play the Woodland Alliance. But again, the Woodland Alliance has a very similar play style with every game. You want to get your base down in the second turn. If you don't manage that, you're in trouble. And then from there, you kind of just, you're in trouble. And then from there, you kind of just spread out, gradually protect your main base, get your other bases established. And eventually, if people leave you unchecked, you explode all over the place with a giant pile of uh, sympathy. And the whole woodland goes, oh, well, we like the green guys best. Um, I think the Eerie Dynasty, that's the fact. I think... The Eerie Dynasty, that's the faction I have the most trouble playing. I think it has the highest skill floor. It can be very frustrating um, when you're learning, um, unless you're great at like logic programming. But I think it also has an incredibly high ceiling. I, I've seen people win games without ever people win games without ever having hit turmoil. They have that level of knowledge and understanding and, and momentum, which is incredible. But I think the Vagabond overall is the, the the character I keep coming back to um, because you get three different Vagabonds, uh, one different Vagabonds. Uh, one of them starts off as a tinker and is more focused on crafting. One of them um, has is the ranger and has a crossbow and a sword to start with. And the other one, the raccoon, is the classic and they're a bit of a thief um, and they sit between the other two. The tinker is very vulnerable to being attacked. Uh, and and I'm vulnerable to being attacked, uh, and and I wish that the other factions had that, that just those having those three choices, and the fact that you can play the vagabond allied with people by helping them out, even to the point you command their troops around a bit, or you can be like a nasty little um, vandal. Uh, that's you know the the thing. Like some of the factions just feel more limited than others, but you may find a faction and fall in love with it and be like, I love this. For me, personally, I absolutely love playing the otters um, from the first expansion and the moles from the third expansion. But most of all, sorry, COVID conspiracy. Struggling a bit there because COVID is quite a common word at the moment. The COVID, the ravens, they are immense fun. I love them to pieces. So you do end up going down this bit of a rabbit hole where you're like, I'll buy the 
core game and you play the core game a bit and then you kind of go okay all the, the cult of lizards or all these these otters these otters look amazing you play with the otters and you go oh my god they're a bunch of thugs they're they're, <laughs> they're meant to be trading but that's not what they do they go around beating things up that's fantastic <laughs> yeah or they go oh what are the moles like and you discover they're like a bunch of like um almost you had to kind of wake up each of discover they're like a bunch of like um almost you had to kind of wake up each of the uh, lords you have to like buy their sympathy and do certain tasks for them before they'll d help you out it's like a very feudal sort of kingdom thing but yeah i've got the four box expansions so that's the main game i've got um, the river folk i've got the thing but yeah i've got the four box expansions so that's the main game i've got um, the river folk i've got the underground um i've got the clockworks i've also got the new deck, which added a whole new life in, because a lot of the stuff's done with a deck of cards. That determines where you can go, where you can do things, what you can craft cards. That determines where you can go, where you can do things, what you can craft. Just changing the deck changed the game so much. Um, you also get new maps and things. So I'm like, I'm pretty close to having everything now. It's been, and even to the point that I got custom inlays, because it's made setting up and breaking down the game much easier. But is the great thing about all of that is you can just get a sample of the game and you can try the core game out on steam with a digital edition it's also on um, android as an app uh it's just gorgeous it's a beautiful presentation of it it feels like playing the board game how the uh clearings are set up normally they're set in a fixed way you can change it and i think that is like what you'd look at to um play it you can also play it on tabletop simulator um, but once I had a chance to play on the root app, I was like, yes, this, this is, I, this might be better than playing the game physically. So much of the finicky little things that you might get wrong, you know, you know what you can do. You might not know why you can do it, but you know what you can do as it highlights your options very well, which is like really wonderful. Also as uh, a synchronous play so that you can play your turn and then just turn off your PC turn off your PC or turn off uh, your Android or do something else. And when you are ready to go back, you will have your turn uh, again and the game will have just moved on just like an old play by email game. Um, it might be a more general topic, but I was wondering... How... Play by email game. Um, it might be a more general topic, but I was wondering how uh, everybody feels about video game adaptation of, uh, of board games. I usually really like them when they really copy the board game and just make it in a more accessible and more directly enjoyable way to play it. Obviously, it, it doesn't, it's not always a way to play it. Obviously, it, it doesn't, it's not always as good as having the actual mini in hand. But I feel that a lot of board games are really nice to, to play in a on a screen and to just be able to play with friends over a long distance without having to do complicated setup. Yeah, well, I'm just looking at my Steam collection. It's the adaptation of the Blood Bowl game. I've got Cult Express. I've got um, Elder Signs Omens. Uh, um, I've even got a few like only um, uh, uh, board game, they're electronic board games only, like Armello and Fatang, which is not a very good game, but fun for a laugh. Um, but yeah, like good. Yeah, the Terraforming Mars one is also fantastic. And I, as bare bones as it is, I love the Race for the Galaxy one. Like, that's just, the AI on that is actually nicely done. So um, I don't think anything beats the tactile experience at all. I would, uh, if, for me personally, if uh, someone said, hey, John, I'd rather that out because it's, it's a bit nicer to sit there uh, with someone and it doesn't feel so bad when they, they crush you horribly or you crush them horribly. Um, but I, I'd say I prefer the fully contained apps, like you say, when they faithfully recreate the game, recreate the game, and they do it like that. And sometimes they even add extra bits and pieces, like Dire Wolf do a very good job. Um, that's really enjoyable. I, I find sometimes the tabletop simulator adaptations to be a bit more frustrating. Um, yeah, but that that's almost by design. Tabletop simulator was not supposed to be the simulator was not supposed to be the the massive um, yeah. thing that it became. It it was first supposed to be a sort of just 
play those fun games and they, they added the modding tools and it just grew into something that is uh, way too big at the moment. Yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the engine was not made to be... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah, the engine was not made to be uh, used for games like KDM. Um, it's a miracle that it runs. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it doesn't feel like a good experience, though, either. Just like moving a piece around in route, like they're just here and I've got, I've got the game up and it's like, oh, I'm just picking where to. That sounds a bit filthy, actually. I do apologize. And then I'm going to rummage around in this ruins. <laughs> oh, I found a boot. Um, that just feels good. But when playing route on tabletop simulator, the act of moving the pieces around just feels awkward with a mouse. I just don't. Yeah, t- tabletop simulator for me is very much. Uh, I don't have it currently. Um, Melania and I have been playing um, uh, Seventh Continent recently, and since it doesn't have a, a proper tabletop simulator version, uh, the way that we had to play was um, using a, a webcam uh, to to film the the cards and just talking loud and, and uh, barely worse than tabletop simulator. I, I actually think that it it might be slightly easier. <laughs> Works. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's when it's done right, it's amazing. Um, or a different experience. I, I think as well. Oh, I, I think as well. Oh, uh, Mysterium is phenomenal. That's one which I forgot. That's yeah, that's really true. Enjoyable. Yeah. Um, uh, so hmm? go on. Uh, no, I, I was just going to say that I like the fact that a lot of video games right now are trying to um, sort of imitate board games but mm. um board games but mm. um e- even though they're they're completely new uh video games like for example uh slay the spire for example is a, a cult battler that that is incredibly popular and really really fun um it could be done as a as a proper tabletop game with uh, an ai decker as a as a proper tabletop game with uh, an ai decker a la kingdom death but it's um as a video game it, it just works well but you can feel that it's very much um a board game at heart and i i like the um, i like this sort of uh uh taking board games because they are more restricted but allow for i think a lot of really interesting tactical things oh yeah, yeah. that castellion is basically a board game mm-hmm. yeah there's um wildermyth is basically a like automated board game role playing yeah and uh, the number of games that have spawned off slay the spire is incredible and remote play on steam so you don't have to have everyone having a copy of the game you can remote play in and everyone can just play on your copy which has been a big big benefit as well as yeah tonight. that that definitely is Indeed. okay but this this just makes me want to um to play it more i'll uh it's on sale yep same um, yeah, the share screen Steam stuff is fantastic, so you can pass and play. And um, uh, it's time we get on to our last topic, which is David with the Genesis. Okay, let's talk about uh, the Genesis. It's a role-playing game, the original version. Let's talk about uh, the Genesis. It's a role-playing game. The original version version was released in 2004, but more like a indie product. And recently, it was re-released in 2014 um, as the Rebirth Edition by Six More Vodka. Six More Vodka is a Berlin-based in 2014 um, as the Rebirth Edition by Six More Vodka. Six More Vodka is a Berlin-based de- uh, graphical design studio. They did a lot of art for white games like League of Legends and Legends of Runeterra, uh, Warner Brothers games, Marvel, Ubisoft, and Rocksteady like League of Legends and Legends of Runeterra, uh, Warner Brothers games, Marvel, Ubisoft and Rocksteady. So they are like state of the art concerning art. What they did is uh, in April this year, they released all books of the Genesis for free. You can just download them via their web. You can just download them via their website. And even if you are not into like the role playing games itself, it's like the artwork is just outstanding. The Genesis takes place in 2095. The whole world collapsed. The world got hit by asteroids in 2073. Those asteroids, 73, those asteroids brought something with them. They not only destroyed the world we, we knew, but they 
also brought something with them called the Primer, which is a spore-based life form, and, and which can manipulate the DNA of Earth-based life. Wait, wait, spore-based? Spore-based, yeah. Based. Spore-based, yeah. So like orcs from 40k? A uh, bit different. But basically, this Primer takes your DNA and twists it. If you would uh, get covered in spores, you would develop certain symptoms, which might lead to your demise somewhere along the line. Um, well, what I've read is um, it it's like considered to be a menace. Uh, the humans are living, they have this primer has very different effects. Just an example, the old area of France, they have the pheromancers, which uh, have some kind of pheromones. And with that, they can lure people into their net and make them work for them, just like human ants or bees. And then you have like something called people who will have pockets of, of warp time and stuff like that. So like if you would walk into this, you would never get out. So it's like a very unique and interesting set setting in general. That's what I really liked about the little that I've looked at it. I haven't played it yet. I've uh, read the, the book in diagonal. Uh, but what I really like is that the universe is very apocalyptic game, but with uh, magic and with this weird sort of universe, it's it's really interesting. And um, if I remember correctly, there's a lot of uh, description of the world actually, like the the different regions and everything. There's um, I know that the, the books are known for being absolute description of the world actually, like the the different regions and everything. There's um, I know that the, the books are known for being absolutely uh, colossal. They're they're hundreds of pages long and there's like uh two of them for the base game right yeah they're like one part is the, the just the background and the other one is like the rules for the actual game um so the, the just the background and the other one is like the rules for the actual game um yeah but the thing about for me like which makes the genesis unique is like not only the artwork but like the lore it's so deep there's so much going on behind the back lines you have like this different cults and cultures you have like i think seven different cultures much going on behind the back lines you have like this different cults and cultures you have like i think seven different cultures which is like germany it's like no known as borka or then you have like something like france which is, is now franca so they took the old countries and twisted them by a lot and then the, like the main players of of the degenesis world just an, as an example the primer is like a really dangerous a really dangerous thing and basically then you have those battalions which is like they are like doctors and they fight against the the primer and the spores so because it's like those those uh, spores so it doesn't get like really dangerous for everyone but on the other side they are like if they find some infection they will burn it down or something like that they are really extreme and so they are like other cults like the clanners which is like it's not a cult itself but it's a lot of different cultural things going on in the background natural enemies because the clanners they don't care if somebody might have uh, infected by the primer but the battalions for them they are yeah they need to die well so when two tribes go to war um what do the player uh play as do they all income homo degenesis uh character or can they play as a as a quote-unquote pure human play as do they all income homo degenesis uh character or can they play as a as a quote-unquote pure human no they they play as humans so basically um what you have is like you have the play the group of players will consist of uh, like people from different cults and uh, just an example uh, we could have have uh, like people from different cults and uh, just an example uh, we could have have scrappers which are basically people who search for any remaining valuable technologies and stuff like that inside of runes then you have like uh, the chroniclers which are like the law keepers when you if you want to get inside of runes then you have like uh, the chroniclers which are like the law keepers when you if you want to see it that way um, there used to be something called the stream, which is like something, yeah, like the internet today. And the stream was like back in 2073, it was everywhere, but uh, during where, but uh, during the apocalypse, the Eschaton, everything got fractured, and now you have like the, the so-called static stream, which are like tiny pockets of the remaining stream, which like a few servers going on, and those chroniclers that try to keep the the, the knowledge flowing inside those pock flowing inside those pockets but like their final goal would be like to restart the stream worldwide 
or like inside a certain area. It kind of seemed like they set the game 50 years too late. <laughs> you know, oddly, um, some of the stuff you described actually reminds me of one of my favorite role-playing games, which is Seven. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I'm bound to talk about it in the future, but you talk about how each part of Europe and Seven Sea takes place in a perverted form of Europe, has their own flavor of like special abilities and everything, and... and um, that, and and they're coming from an outside source, which I was like, that's kind of quite. Okay, sometimes there's like some kind of strange interaction, like uh, Hyperspania. You have this strange interaction where they sometimes the Homo Degenesis will actually help people, but you don't know what they are asking for. Like they could ask for yeah your lifetime basically. They could just do you a favor and take you with them for years or something. So in some, it's going up against a bunch of super powered individuals. Yeah. Exactly, but basically they are they are like the evil guys if you want to t put it that way, but like sometimes they won't even yeah look like that for you because like if you get caught in the pheromones of some like a pheromancer, you will see him as a friend, as and you will be like happy and uh... <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's I thought so that's why I used the word antagonist rather than outright villain because uh, yeah I, I I'm used to and enjoy role playing games where the bad guys so to speak are um at least from one perspective generally their own not necessarily bad guys so to speak are um at least from one perspective generally their own not necessarily all that bad so it does sound interesting um and i do enjoy a good post-apocalyptic setting for all its flaws cthulhu tech i still still love that game yeah. You know, by by the way it is described, and I'm actually delving, I'm still delving in the source book because I have to say there's a lot of material uh, available for free online, and it is an impressive work, especially the campaign setting, which has its own book. It reminds me which has its own book. It reminds me a lot of the 90s Shadowrun uh, RPG as a setting. Of course, this is a good thing, but the better thing is that it doesn't play at all like like it. Because, well, Shadowrun was a mess as the integrations of the degenerated uh, humans, subhumans and all, was a messy, while the Genesis actually um, creates an organic and um, functioning world. I have no experience with the game, but by reading what is the very very interesting um i think that thing that's like a bit special about the system is like you know you have shadow run and uh, dungeon dragons where you have a lot of fights in this game in this game you don't want to fight seriously it's like super deadly if you take a hit your character will be in serious trouble super deadly if you take a hit your character will be in serious troubles like one or two hits are fine, but if you have like some serious injury, it will take weeks in game to heal. So most of the time, it's not like like in Dungeon Dragons where you just have a fight for fun, but rather you try to avoid it or just to plan around it. You know, like in Dungeon Dragons where you just have a fight for fun, but rather you try to avoid it or just to plan around it. You know, like it's like more the the game itself. It's more about uh, storytelling and social interactions than than real fights. Fights will happen, but if they happen, they should be meaningful. Yeah. Storytelling and social interactions than than real fights. Fights will happen, but if they happen, they should be meaningful. Yeah, of course. So no for dice chuckers. Yeah, exactly. That's actually a question that I had. How crunchy is the gameplay? Because I have only read the campaign book, uh, as I said, uh, superficially. I was wondering, because I have only read the campaign book, uh, as I said, uh, superficially. I was wondering if, if it was a game with a, a lot of different checks and different uh, dice rolls, or if it was a more uh, simple and more uh, story-oriented game. Uh, basically, it's like, it's a very story-oriented game, but it has added. It's a pool-based D6 pool system, so you have like you to take like uh, you take a bunch of D6, basically attribute plus skill combined, and then roll it, and everything above a four will be a success, and a six will be a trigger, and this, those triggers can be used for, and this, those triggers can be used for like special effects and stuff like that, 
but you will never chuck more than 12 dice at the same time. If, if your like pool exceeds 12 dice, all dice above the 12 will be an auto success. That still seems like a fair amount of die. <laughs> yeah, sure it is, but we played Shadowrun for, for quite a bit and then sometimes you had like dice pool of like 20 pieces or something. Yeah, there's a reason why Shadowrun is not exactly considered as a, a, a straightforward game. <laughs> Yep. I'm always of the opinion if you want to play Shadowrun, you're best off like just enjoying the Shadowrun computer games. <laughs> yeah, they, take, they it, are. It cuts all of the mechanics wild. away and you just get to enjoy the story. I need to, to try it and, and find a table, but I've been running uh, way too many RPGs already and, and starting a new one is always uh, uh, always hard. Yeah, yeah it, it does look really fun. Uh, one thing I really like to point out is their website as well. Like you have... Not only can you download the which characters are inside that city at the moment, and the artwork itself is already fantastic. And there's one thing which really goes gets the like the whole Degenesis uh, community going. It's like the meta plot, like the, the the story behind everything what's happening. And there's something prophecy. So all the plot of the whole game is inside of single prophecy. And people are still trying to figure out what's happening and what's like what this uh, prophecy means, which is like really interesting because you have like people finding pieces of lore or just like pictures inside the books, like pictures inside the books, and connect those pieces and try to figure out what will what's going to happen. So it's like a big yeah you know similar to the things we are doing in Kingdom Death when we have like this yeah you know not exactly clear storytelling pieces small piece pieces of lore we can find and then connect the dots. pieces of lore we can find and then connect the dots yeah yeah it sounds very interesting <laughs> i would be looking into it more if it wasn't the fact that i'm already backlogged so hard i've got complete masks of naliotep to run through and then the enemy within campaign to run through because it's just been re-released and i bought the special editions and then i've got the void to do um which is a I'll talk about that at some point, actually. Quite quite good. The Genesis was making me think of it, which it says good things about the Genesis as a concept, you know. It, it sounds like one of those games, it's like, the, um, what was it, um, Tales of the Flood, Tales of the Loop, Loop, which I'm like, oh, I really, I really want to look at these. But if I do, I'm going to want everything and I'm going to want physical copies and then I'm going to fed, be fed up with running what I'm running and want to play that instead and it's all going to suffer so I'm going to have to put a note in my diary a couple of years from now to say go right take a look at the Genesis you've got the space yeah I know that face yeah I know that feeling <laughs> yeah too yeah, many that, games that's the curse of the role player um, too curse. many games not enough times not enough tables curse of the lifetime GM at, at one time I had like nearly all hardcover releases of Pathfinder 1.0 so like nearly all hardcover releases of Pathfinder 1.0. So like <laughs> it took away a lot of space as well. <laughs> yeah. The the curse of the GM is more having a group of players interested in playing on one game, reading the entire setting book, the entire rule book, making a uh, prepping is more having a group of players interested in playing on one game, reading the entire setting book, the entire rule book, making a uh, prepping a campaign or uh, at least a start scenario, and then having that group just failing to play a single game. Uh, I've, I've never had that. No, I just had the curse of always a GM, never a had the curse of always a GM, never a player. But in contrast to that, I am a nightmare to have as a player. The few times I have been, everyone who's GM says, you're far too much work, Finn. And, and I'm like, just let my character do what they want to do and, and I will be no problem to your plot. But then I'm, I'm going to be like awkward. I can't help it. I apologize. So, yeah, it's, um, it de I, definitely could be fun to talk about role playing at some point in the future in some detail. It it definitely will. Uh, we might actually make a, a full um a full team for one episode because I feel like all of us have our uh, good experiences to share. So, thank you very much for listening. This has been the Last Standy podcast. Uh, I have been your host, Fen, and I have been joined here by the team, which is and would everyone would like to say their names and say goodbye. Uh, Alexis, and goodbye. Yeah, Alessio, and arrivederci.